Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Wolfgang Miesbach from the University Hospital in Frankfurt, and I would like to welcome you to this joint session by EHAT and the ISTH about gene therapy and hemophilia, hemophilia gene therapy, and the key components of clinical care. Um, this is a very much experienced faculty, including Mike Mekris from the Sheffield Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center in UK, Flora Peivanti, um, Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Milan and current head of the EHAT and me. And these are the learning objectives of this 60 minute session outline the current and emerging approaches for treating hemophilia, including various approaches to gene therapy, better identify key characteristics of current clinical trials in gene therapy for both hemophilia A and hemophilia B, and also to recognize key concerns and unknowns relate, related to the future of gene therapy of hemophilia. Um, some slides about the accreditation statements, the disclosure policy, and the disclosures of the three presenters. And we also would like to thank very much uh, the sponsors of this session, Biomarine Spark Therapeutics and Unicure. Now, this is the agenda of today. Mike Macris will start with an EHAT update on gene therapy. And then we will hear um, some interesting information about the EHAT gene therapy working group. And Flora will close our session today um, with the models of delivery of future hemophilia care, mentioning the hub and spoke model by EHAT in EHC. And this is, I would like to forward to Mike. Mike, please. Thanks, Wolfgang. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. For the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to give you an update of the gene therapy presentations that were given at EHAD 2021. EHAD uh, stands for the European Association for Hemophilia and Allied Disorders. And we had our 14th meeting in February. It was obviously virtual in view of the current pandemic. There were over 3,000 registered participants from over 100 countries. The first uh, important presentation that was given as an oral was uh, by Stephen Pipe from the US. And you can see is the efficacy and safety of an unpronounceable name. But what the key part of this for all of you to remember, this is the Unicure gene therapy trial, which is a phase three trial called HOPE B. It's obviously uh, in hemophilia B, it uses AAV5, adenosine virus 5, and with the patio variant to increase the expression. And importantly, persons with anti-AAV5 antibodies were included in the study. And hepatitis C patients were included, provided they've cleared hepatitis C, and also provided they did not have cirrhosis. They showed data on 54 patients. And the key top results from this presentation, I've got a couple of slides to show you next, but the key top results are at six months, the, they were, the patients had a median of 37% factor IX level. There was an equal response, surprisingly, to patients with and without anti-AAV5. And one person in this uh, study, in this trial, developed hepatocellular carcinoma. So these are the factor IX levels of all the patients. Uh, these are the means. And as you can see, this shows fairly steady levels. What's important, however, to appreciate is the variability with the error bars there. Actually, they're the minimum maximum bars. But as you can see, this is, these are huge. So the mean 
tells you something, but there is also something hidden from the mean that you need to appreciate that variability is big in this and every other gene therapy study. The other very important um, finding from this study was that patients with antibodies to the vector AAV5 actually uh, responded surprisingly well. On the x-axis, you see the antibody level to AAV5, and on the y-axis is the factor IX level. And as you can see, even patients with anti-AAV5 had a fairly good um, response to the gene therapy. And all except one patient that had a really huge um, antibody to AAV5 over 3000, which would be probably three screens to your right if we were to plot it, did not have an ex uh, any expression. There was another presentation that was uh, given as a poster presentation by Pradima Chowdhury. And this was uh, a phase one, two gene therapy study. And this is the free line um, factor nine study. This is again, hemophilia B using AAV S3 with a patio variant. And this study uses prophylactic steroids with and without tacrolimus. Um, it's a complicated design of four dose cohorts. They were trying to find out what dose of vector to use in their phase three study. And um, essentially they were targeting normal factor nine levels. And the key points from their results, they have durable results for up to three years. They are getting levels in the normal range. One patient with supraphysiological levels of um, factor nine developed an uh, um, arteriovenous fistula uh, thrombosis. And um, they mentioned that their target for their phase three study of the vector will be between 6.4 and 8.3 times 10 to the 11. So um, I'm, I'm only showing the data from cohorts three and four. And as you can see, day three, it was only two patients in cohort four, it was four patients, but uh, three of the patients, oh, sorry, two of the patients had levels above the upper limit of normal and two in the normal range. There was one other gene therapy study uh, given as an oral presentation uh, by Spencer Sullivan from the US. And this is the SPARC phase one, two gene therapy trial. This is hemophilia A and um, this is AAV again with B domain deleted factor eight. And their target was, they were aiming to use a low vector dose and they showed data from four patients. And their results are on 5E11, which is quite a low dose for hemophilia A. The factor eight levels at one year were 5.9 to 21.8%. Uh, and three of the four patients required steroids. So as you can see on the left-hand side is the 5E11 from Spark, and some of and the others are the other clinical trials in hemophilia A. And as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, one of the trials uses 100 times more vector than the Spark study. So these are the patients. The one patient that didn't have uh, steroids is the one that got levels of 26%, and the patients that got steroids um, had levels that averaged at 6%. There was quite an interesting, so far I've shown you the presentations that are by the investigators and industry. There was a very interesting presentation from a person who participated in a gene therapy trial. And this was the title of the lecture was a a patient's journey and it was given by Luke Pembroke from the UK. And actually Luke interpreted, uh, um, uh, gave a modern interpretation of the word lecture because he described uh, uh, one of his visits to his hemophilia center from leaving home, getting on the London underground and getting to the center. But there, and this is freely available. If you want to see this video, 
is the, the link is there. And the important things that come out of Luke's uh, presentation is the issue of adverse events of gene therapy. And everybody that gives presentations tends to concentrate on the adverse events of the gene therapy itself. However, um, after looking at this presentation, a, a really key aspect, I think, of gene therapy for patients going into it, you need to know what are the chances of needing steroids and what are the adverse events of steroids. The next aspect that was tackled at the meeting was the long-term toxicity, which is very hot at the moment. And Denise Sabatino gave a lecture on uh, the, their, their uh, studies. They, they, she showed one of the, um, the recently published study of hemophilia A dogs that uh, up to 10 years following gene therapy, they looked at um, what happened to the factor eight levels and to the liver. So the, pay, the, the dogs had stable um, expression up to 10 years in contrast to what's happening in humans with hemophilia A gene therapy. But two of the dogs uh, had increasing expression after four years, which was interesting. And she went on to show that there was uh, AAV integration and clonal expansion, but no tumor formation. And for the first time, there was also a presentation from the Canadians on their gene therapy dog model. Uh, again, hemophilia A, and this is um, the dogs had gene therapy eight to 12 years earlier um, with different types of uh, AAV, different doses. And because the dogs were reaching the end of their lives, they were euthanized and their liver was examined in great detail with detailed integration studies. Their results show well, no, no major abnormalities in the liver. There was a low level of uh, integration, um, but it occurs in about one in a thousand hepatocytes. And only 6% of the integration was uh, in gene integration. Here are the details of their eight dogs. And there were gene therapy was done when the dogs were largely under one year of age variable doses, and the follow-up is quite long, as you can see. Um, all the dogs except one was more than 10 years. And the interesting findings they had, they showed the data of um, what was happening in the liver uh, of the AAV. The vast majority, as was expected, is as episomal, i.e. is not integrated. But there was integration of the AAV um, to different amounts. And as you can see on this slide, the orange is the integrated vector and the blue is the episomal vector. Although the level of integration is small because there are so many liver cells, the number of cells getting integrated DNA from the, ve from the vector is quite high. Um, they looked where the integration happened, and basically it was only in about 6% that it was in gene, and the others were upstream or downstream. Liver cancer is becoming a hot topic in gene therapy in hemophilia. Uh, none of the dogs in the Sabatino or Batti presentations had um, any problems with liver cancer, and none of the other gene therapy programs did. However, a single patient described by um, Stephen Pipe had um, liver cancer. And the issue is, is that related to AAV integration next to an oncogene or is this hepatitis C related um, hepatocellular carcinoma? There was an interesting presentation in one of the satellites um, that from a hepatologist and basically the point that he was making as long as you have um, cirrhosis in the liver, you continue to have a risk of liver cancer, even if you clear the hepatitis C using modern therapy. The final presentation I want to highlight is this one by Maze Nakache from, and this is showcasing the World Federation of Hemophilia Gene Therapy Registry. This is an agreed international registry of 
patients once their therapies become uh, approved, hopefully everybody will join the effort and get all the data submitted centralized. There was a publication of the data or the core data set in JTH recently. So the, this is my final slide. The key issues of gene therapy discussed at 2021 were the durability and hemophilia B does better than hemophilia A, the variability, no, I'm not coming to any conclusion at this stage just to, because the data are not shown in exactly the same way, but uh, it's a significant issue. Response to steroids, hemophilia better tend to do better than A. In terms of adverse events, they have the initial uh, short-term uh, transaminitis with lots of expression, and the long-term is the integration in liver cancer. Thrombosis will possibly become more of an issue if you're targeting normal levels and um, monitoring will be key. And the delivery of gene therapy care will be discussed by Flora um, in the third presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, Mike for this very interesting presentation about the preclinical and clinical studies presented at the recent EHAT Congress and also for giving this outlook regarding um, liver health uh, safety issues and uh, the WFH gene therapy registry. Now, I would like to continue um, about uh, the aims of the gene therapy working group. And I would like to start uh, what is EHAT. EHAT is a multidisciplinary uh, association of healthcare professionals. So the member include all members of the hemophilia treatment centers, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, but also social workers, psychologists, researchers from across Europe. And since it, its establishment in 2007, 2007 uh, the aim of EHAT is to improve the care for individuals with bleeding disorders and hemophilia. And since its uh, beginning, um, EHAT started with continuing efforts, efforts first of all to improve uh, the care of hemophilia and bleeding disorders, uh, next uh, to educate um, the medical community and also the general practitioners about bleeding disorders and also to promote uh, scientific research. And um, as well, uh, since very early, uh, EHAT tries to focus uh, on potential risks of uh, treatments and founded the European Hemophilia Safety Surveillance Scheme, the UHAS registry. And uh, this, is, this is a pharmacovigilance program uh, to promote a safety of treatment of hemophilia and bleeding disorders. So um, 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 the EHAT Congress is a very important part of EHAT. Uh, is held every year in early February. So it started in 2008 uh, with only 190 participants. And um, is the number of participants increased. So uh, during the Prague Congress, there were more than 2,600 participants in even more. Um, in the, at the Congress in uh, the Hague, and as Mike mentioned, as a recently uh, performed virtual Congress. So the EAD Congress is a three-day meeting from Wednesday to Friday with a focus on clinical management. And what is unique to the EHAT Congress is that there is a pre-Congress day for nurses, um, physiotherapists, and psycho psychosocial professionals. Uh, this is held since 2017. And uh, said there is a single track session. So everyone hears the same message and there is no hurry uh, from one um, session to the other. And as well, there is no uh, um, exhibition of the industry. But now the EHAT um, has a lot of more parts not only the annual congresses, there are a lot of 
committees, so from the nurses, from the physiotherapists. So there are some research grants provided to excellent research. And also there's a very nice hemophilia central locator um, for, everyone, for everybody traveling. A very important part of EHAT is the coagulation factor variant databases where known genetic uh, variants are listed and as well as the European Hemophilia Central certification. So in Europe, we have more than 400 hemophilia centers with different standards of care. And it was the aim of the certification to harmonize um, the hemophilia care in Europe and of course the UHAS. By uh, the network activities, it is possible uh, to work together very closely and uh, to connect um, researchers and clinical practitioners um, into this area and also to improve the quality of care. So there are some networks of the European physiotherapists, the European nurses, the psychological professionals for the women and bleeding disorders, and of course now um, very um, recently founded for gene therapy. Um, it is very important for EHA to close to cooperate very closely to the EHC, the European Hemophilia Consortium. Um, 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 so is this is a fruitful cooperation with some joint publications and position statements. And say we also cooperated uh, together uh, on UHANET, UHAS, and uh, the European Central Certification. Now, uh, clinical uh, trials of um, gene therapy uh, started very early. So the first trials are documented in 1989. And since then, more and more clinical trials have been performed, as you can see on the right figure. Of course, most of these trials are early phase trials, phase one trials, and most of these trials are performed in the US. Um, um, the gene therapy construct we use in hemophilia is an AD based construct. And according to this publication, around 130 gene therapy studies with this AV are performed not only in hemophilia, um, but not only in adults, but also in adolescents and uh, pediatricians. And uh, what do we know so far uh, from hemophilia? So uh, Mike mentioned all the recent um, findings from the EHAT Congress. We know that with gene therapy now, it would be possible to achieve a sustained long-term factor eight and factor nine expression, which may lead to a correction of bleeding, discontinuation of prophylaxis. We know so far, of course, there's only a limited number of patients treated, but we know so far that there would be no risk of development inhibitor against factor eight or factor nine, and the patient uh, benefit from a long lasting maintenance of joint health. But of course, there are some adverse events known um, of gene therapy um, of hemophilia. So they are uh, related to the immunogenicity of the gene therapy. They can be due to humoral or cell-mediated immunity. So we know that uh, um, there would be an important role of pre-existing anti-AV antibodies, which lead to the fact that the majority of patients uh, is still excluded from gene therapy trials. And we know that the, one of the most important adverse events is a dose-dependent transient um, AV-associated liver toxicity. So with the next slide, um, we see uh, the questions raised so far from the results from the clinical trials and some outlook uh, how these questions could be resolved in the future. So um, we know that there is a variable efficacy uh, in patients at all. 
And um, we know that in most trials, patients with neutralizing antibodies are excluded, but not in all trials. And it would be very interesting to see the final results of the phase three trials and of further clinical trials planned in the future. Furthermore, what is the impact of AV serotypes on immune response, liver toxicity and efficacy? We also have heard that there is some different outcome on patients treated prophylactically with prednisolone and with prednisolone on demand. And there are also some other immunosuppressive agents playing a major role in this field. This also would hopefully be answered with phase three trials. Why do individual responses differ? So there are some patients with great responses and there are patients with very um, low factor expression. Um, probably we should more about the characteristics of the patient and some predicting factors and liver biopsies, which now are carried, old, uh, carried out, uh, may help to answer this question. Now we have several companies and each company uses its own immunological tests and there is urgently needed a harmonization and validation of the tests used also with the help of reference standard material. Uh, at all, it would be um, very much important to have a better understanding of the immune response to AV and its treatment and um, for the long-term safety, which is still one unknown in gene therapy, um, we hope to the help of the preclinical studies and also um, for the global prospective multicentric lifelong registry, which is now carried out by the WFH in close cooperation with the scientific organizations. Now, transaminitis and ALT elevation is the main adverse events. ALT is a very sensitive and specific marker of hepatocyte damage. And we know from the clinical trials so far that in every trial, ALT elevation occurred and it is dose dependent mostly from week four till 10, but it also can uh, occur later on in all trials, it was transient, so no persistent ALT elevation, and it was treatable in most cases with short doses of steroids. In most cases, it was related to a T cell reaction, but not in all cases. And um, one of the disadvantages of the ALT elevation is that it can be associated with a reduced factor expression and therefore it would be very much important, very important to prevent um, ALT elevation or if they occur to treat them as soon as possible. Now about the EHA gene therapy working group, we, has, we have three aims with our working group. First of all, we would like to provide critical information to physicians about gene therapy in terms of practicability and safety. So uh, for the training of the European healthcare professionals, um, uh, a partnership was launched uh, with the ISTH and um, the France Foundation. And um, it is also our aim to inform patients because there are so much patients, uh, so much, so much questions from patients and also from general practitioners. And um, the third aim would be to collect data on different gene therapy trials, tests, and adverse events. And this is a list of um, the members of the gene therapy working group. Um, so there are different members from different countries. So for example, Pratima Shodari, Daniel Hart, Victor Jimenez Juste, Robert Klamrud, Mike Macris, Declan Noon from the EHC and Flora Pevandi. And this is a list of the educational activities carried out so far 
in partnership with ISTH, so Train the Trainer Workshop, podcasts, conference briefings and virtual learning lesson sessions about the EHAT Conference 2021. And finally, um, this is the action plan. So what we would like to achieve in the future, um, our impression is that um, an open-based uh, access database um, available for everybody would be needed where all the important results of the gene therapy trials in hemophilia could be included and could be checked including all adverse events, uh, the short-term uh, events, medium and long-term events, with the possibility of a rapid response and interaction. So one of the main uh, aim of this working group is to investigate further the gene therapy safety and its outcome parameters. Um, and we would like to provide updates on the recent developments in terms of ALT elevation results and safety at, at outcomes uh, regarding uh, the short and long-term adverse events, uh, the use of steroids and immunosuppressive treatments, and also the assays for monitoring response. And finally, um, one of our aim is to improve the intra infrastructure for the widespread dissemination of gene therapy and to improve uh, the infrastructure after approval uh, of gene therapy. And for this purpose, EHART has developed a so-called hub and spoke model together with AEA EHC. And this hub and spoke model um, will be allocated further by Flora Pevandi with the next talk. Thank you very much. Wolfgang, and um, I want to thank everyone for the organization, France Foundation and ISDH for giving us the opportunity as EHAT to bring the information about what we have done, what is the action of EHAT and where we are standing. And during my presentation, my goal would be to explain a little bit where we are standing in terms of models of hemophilia care in the new era. It was uh, clearly explained by Mike what was the advances in gene therapy. And also it has been explained very clear with Wolfgang where we are standing as organization and what is our thought. And I think what I'm gonna do is giving a little bit of responsibility to clinician and uh, to who of you in the future is going to use the gene therapy to think about and start to think about how to organize actually the center and, um, and what we have to do. I think there is no doubt, and there was so many times in these recent meetings, we have seen how much has been done in terms of improvement of treatment in the last two decades by moving from pre-replacement therapy to different generation of replacement therapy, standard to extended and now non-replacement, and finally the gene therapy. And soon we would have the possibility to actually use the gene therapy. But did we make our job in terms of how change the hemophilia treatment centers and make it suitable for all these changes in terms of treatment. So if I'm thinking in my center, since I was a medical student, the center was made by physicians, internists, or hematologists that they were working in a multidisciplinary group in order to make the prevention of bleeding, of course, with the improvement of treatment that we have seen, and um, also management of patients with inhibitor. This was one of the biggest problems for us as a clinician, how to manage it, how to eradicate it, and, uh, and how to behave in terms of the acute bleeding. And 
how I have to do in the joint and muscle damage and what are the aspects which I have to discuss with orthopedician, physiotherapist, and physiatrists, and also how I'm going to manage the surgery with the surgeon in terms of inhibitor and non-inhibitor and the laboratory. And unfortunately, in the 90s, we had to face up very much with the problem of HCV and HIV and with the immunology. So we did do something to improve our knowledge and our organization. And recently, we also started to switch our patient to the extended half-life product and trying to understand whether the personalization and the PK should be done and what are the timeline that we are doing. And also in terms of non-replacement therapy, understanding what are the targets and the scores and what is really the power of each single drugs and how I'm going to measure it. And finally, in, in our centers that they did have the possibility to treat the patient with gene therapy and with dosing, they understood that hemophilia center could not be as it is now. And we need to move, we need to evolve. And what we have to do, this is only few thought that um, we were doing as a working group, actually, uh, chaired by Wolfgang. And um, we want to share it with you. And I'm sure in the future, there would be a lot of work. And also, is a collaboration of EHAD and EHC. This is start to say that gene therapy is a replacement, until now, of a dysfunctional gene with an exogenous functional gene to prevent the bleeding for the long term with the optimal goal to cure the disease, which is not yet our case, but with Adon Associated, we have seen the long-term um, resolution of bleeding and that with a very good results and stop of prophylaxis and more than 90%. But how much gene therapy evolved and where we are standing we can see that in 1994, there was a time publication on the genetic, the future is now. And that time we had 60 clinical trials. And now if you look on the clinicaltrial.gov, we can see that we are almost close to 4,700 clinical trial ongoing. And that I would say something is moving and there is no doubt. And as Mike showed, some of the data are very interesting, but Totally, we have five clinical trials of hemophilia A and B gene therapy in phase three. Unicure and SPARC on hemophilia B and biomarine SPARC and Sangamo Pfizer on hemophilia A. And we expect, if nothing strange is going to happen, in 2022, that we could have at least one, on one gene therapy in hemophilia A and one in hemophilia B. So now, based on this type of data and evolution that we had, how hemophilia center should be organized or rearranged, and what services would be, should be available. In 2013, there was an important work of UHAS and EHAD together in order to come up with the European guidelines of the certification of hemophilia center. In June 2013, there was a classification of two European hemophilia treatment center. One EHCCC, which is comprehensive care center with the specialized and multidisciplinary care at the highest level. And then EH. TC with a local routine care, which should take care of routine uh, need of the patients in different parts of the world. And almost 115 EHCCCs and 42 EHCCs have been reported, and you can find it at the EHAD and UHAS website. However, recently, as has been explained by Wolfgang, there are lots of movement and thoughts in terms of organization, both European organization, patients and scientific, EHAD and EHC. We started to think about, and we said, okay, the organization that we thought 
is perfect, fantastic, but might need a little bit more work on it in order to create or promote a hub and spoke model for the treatment of hemophilia patients, A and B at this point, who are going through gene therapy. And let's go to see how we think this model should work. We think that a national hub center should prescribe and manage exclusively the, um, the dosing of the gene therapy by the expert hemophilia comprehensive care center. So that should be done only with the expert groups where there are all facilities that we're gonna see. And we are not sure that every country should have so many of these centers because it's expensive, it's time consuming, and we need to understand for which number of population, which number of hub centers is needed. And for a spoke centers, we need to think about that this center could be the treatment center in close communication with the primary expert hub centers, monitoring and following up the patient who been dosed at the national hub centers. I'm trying to work with my, okay. And this hub and model, uh, a spoke model, we think is an effective way and is a effective way because to extend the quality and timely customized assistance to remote hospital, we need to have a network which is functional. This could improve the patient health outcome and clinical and management accuracy through again, a very accurate network. And as I said before, this model could help us to avoid the duplication of service dislocation of health intervention across multiple sites, and also the flexibility to add new satellites when is needed. And as I said before, depends on how many clinical um, uh, gene therapy we want to do and how many patients on gene therapy, because that's a huge amount of work and depends on the facility and the time of the follow-up. So that should be flexible model in the future that we can adopt it. The reason why we think this network organization is extremely important, because as has been explained, there are only few patients, even if we have a lot of advances in gene therapy, but only few patients have been treated. And the response rate and persistence of transgene expression have been, have been shown clearly by Mike in some of the clinical trial gene therapy could differ. There is an inter and intra individual variability, and we need to understand how that works. The labs might not be enough and organized as, a, as they are equipped and organized now, and there are discrepancies in the one stage and chromogenic, and we need to make sure the dosing center, they have all the facility to come up when is needed with a different assay. We have um, a quick, I would say, between 20 to 50 exposure uh, day uh, time, actually weeks after the dosing with enzyme, uh, transaminitis liver enzyme movement, which require attention. And you need the people around you to understand how to treat the patient, which stroke and which dosage, how long, whether there is any side effect of the steroid, how I'm going to manage it, should I add the, to the steroid some other immunosuppressive treatment, and whether I have to change based on the age of the patient, the type of the treatment. Of course, the allergic reaction, but that I think we are used at the hemophilia treatment center. And long-term toxicity, and again, has been shown what, uh, in the dog model we have seen in terms of the vector integration, it's true that we have only one integration in 100,000 cells, but still with the amount of the vector that we are injecting, it might not be very small and we need really to follow up our patient and to understand. And last but not least, the important point is the psychology of our patients. 
we need, first of all, to educate ourselves, our patient, and also to take care of them when we are making the injection and dosing, and they are expecting to have a higher amount of the factor, and then the loss of expression is happening, and what, how we are going to manage that. So it's important to create the model which is ensuring the safe introduction, use monitoring and optimal learning capacity for all eligible patients everywhere. And also that is a center, to my opinion, can prepare and make the administration of gene therapy, determination of the coagulation immunological parameter as we see, to be able to make a very good evaluation of the joint score and joint function and liver health, and if there is a need of the surgery, that also should be planned. So that's a model more or less is in our um, mind, which, as I said, there should be a national hub which is exclusively prescribing and administrating the gene therapy by the, is formed by the expert hemophilia comprehensive center. And then consecutively, there are moni monitoring process of all patients in close communication in the SPOC centers in communication with the hub. So this hub and cent uh, SPOC center, as I said before, I'm not sure everything that I re I'm reporting here in two years' time would be similar. I think all of us, we have to think, this is what we thought as a working group, but it's important to understand, for example, is it enough to have laboratory storage system, preparation, pharmacy, hepatologist, immunologist, fibro scan, possibility of liver biopsy, evaluation of immunosuppression, long time follow-up, and follow up and also evaluation of consistency review, which is important at the hub center. And what at the spoke, as I said before, collaboration, networking, education, enrolling, and trying through the spoke center to attract those patients that they want to make the gene therapy, but that facility is not there. And we are working together and we give this uh, facility to our patients. So I think this dynamic model actually requires a lot of work of all of us as a community in the future. So the consideration that I want to bring to all of you, gene therapy is a new therapeutic approach that we definitely transform the life of our patients. And this is a complex and dynamic system with the potential complications in the prescription, administration, and monitoring. And this should be the responsibility of a specialized center with the facility that every country is organizing. The expert hub should have specialists who can ensure expertise. And they are educated and well-designed people in a timely manner could take care of gene therapy administration, management, and any eventual adverse event and monitoring. And as I said, the last but not the least important point is the education for both patients, which I think the patient's organization should take care of it, and the scientific organization should take care of implementation of the science and for the dissemination for patients, patients' organization, and, and for the other healthcare professional, probably the EHAD, ISDH, and other scientific organizations to take care of it. And I think with this one, this was my last slide. Yeah, just remind you that EHAD is trying to be dynamic with the gene therapy working group that you have seen with the list of questions that we are updating every day, and also trying to make the upgrade of the accreditation model that has been done, and trying to make it join with the gene therapy working group in terms of the organization of hub and spoke model. And we hope in one year time, we would be able to come up 
with the new and revised version of the accreditation model. And thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Flora, for this um, great uh, presentation. So if you miss the latest uh, gene therapy hemophilia abstracts, this would be possible on the eHeart website. Very interesting uh, to look um, into these presentations.